Thank you for watching video from One Church of High Point. We hope that today's message encourages you to connect to God, to others, and to your purpose. If you're looking for more information about One Church or for more resources, visit onechurchnc.net. So if you guys want to get your Bibles out, we're going to be in Ephesians 2. I took my shoes off initially because my niece graduated from Alabama on Friday and somebody behind her got her diploma and tripped down the stairs. And I thought, oh my goodness, what if that's me? But um, as they were singing, I was just reminded of holy ground. Um, So I kept them off because where the Lord is, it's holy ground. So Ephesians 2 reminds us of our value, um, that we are changed and accepted, that we've been reconciled to him, and that he doesn't care what we have to offer him. It's only that he chose us. So Ephesians 2, 11 through 13 says, So then remember that at one time you were once Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcised by those called circumcised, which is done in the flesh by human hands. At that time, you were without Christ, excluded from citizenship of Israel and foreigners to the covenant of promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who are far far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. When I read that, I just remember all the things that made me unworthy of him and that he didn't care. Um, The scripture says, remember. I think oftentimes we get saved and we forget what God has brought us from. We're so quick to see the sin in others when God has brought us from the same wretched place, um, making those mistakes. Our salvation is based off of what he did for us, not what we have to offer him. And then notice that it also says that we were um, called uncircumcised by the circumcised. So I think that the church is just naturally built to not support, our human nature is that we are quick to point people's flaws out, um, to notice when people aren't doing what they should. We can look, I'm sure, across the church and think about who you've made a judgment about. And God, God is calling us to be the church. All morning we were talking about being filled up and overflowing. We think like, fill me up, Lord, that it's about how we feel. It's about fill me up, take my hurts away, you know, take my anxiety away, help me pay my bills, help my relationship. But God wants to pour into us so much joy that it overflows on others. Hebrews 10, 14 says, we are being made holy. We are not yet holy. God is working all of us towards that. Luke 6, 41 says, um, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? And the way the Passion Translation says it is really impactful. It says, it's easy to see the smudge on your neighbor's face and be oblivious to the ugly snare on your own. Do you know that you have no, you have the nerve to say, let me wash your face when your own face is distorted by contempt. It's this I know better than you mentality again, playing holier than thou, part instead of just living your own. Wipe that ugly sneer off your face and you might be fit to offer the washcloth to your neighbor. I think that's why our testimony is so powerful. I think that... um, That's where we came from. And when you tell people your testimony, they're fully aware of God and how he's brought you through it. We oftentimes want to lecture people about the goodness of Christ, but we don't tell them how he's good. We don't show that he's good. We walk around and we say, pray for me because I'm having the worst day instead of claiming his promises It's not by mistake that a couple people this week, not very close to me, um, have come to me specifically with anxiety and fear in their lives and um, wanting me to pray for them. And last night I couldn't sleep. I felt overwhelmed by fear and anxiety. And um, God 
places those situations in our lives to prepare us for future, that our, his truths are way better to be told than, okay, I'll be praying for you. Y'all, we got to do it. We have to pray then. Talking about it is not enough. Um, has anyone seen the Mr. Rogers movie? It was, I fell in love. I was obsessed with Mr. Rogers after seeing this movie. It's called like A Beautiful Neighborhood. And Mr. Rogers is this like impossibly kind, patient, generous person that just seems like completely selfless. Everything he does is, um, he halts everything when, when somebody is in need or he feels, you know, they need prayer. He would just stop. And, and you just feel like I could never be that. I can't be that person that's constantly, because we're selfish. I mean, I'm a very selfish person. I think about what affects my life. And his, his wife was interviewed and she's, and they asked her, is he always like this? Like, is this just how he is? And she's like, no, he works really hard at it. And that is what we have to realize is that we have to work really hard at this. And, um, the whole book of Ephesians, you know, as we get further on, when pastor asked me to preach, I really wanted to preach out of the fourth book because I love the armor of God. And I thought like, that is what it is is required of us. The full armor of God is not just going to church, tithing a little bit, saying our prayers, a five minute prayer. It is preparing daily. It is dying to ourselves. It is asking God to take that ugliness or the thoughts that we have and turning them into his. Um, we have got to do harder work. Um, as I was preparing this week, of course, every rude person, slow drivers, minor inconvenience. My computer wouldn't work. I couldn't get word open. And I was so frustrated. And immediately God was like, you expect a lot of grace for yourself. But when you, when you have it to give to others, it's very, very insignificant. You don't have any um, grace left for them. So I think that more than anything, that the church needs to be unified. Um, How do we represent him in our frustrations? How do we represent him when we don't agree with others standing beside us? Um, In in the book about Joseph, um, his brothers sell him off. Everybody kind of knows the story, but they were jealous of him. So he was, um, one brother just wanted to kill him. The other one, they agreed they'll just sell him off to somebody as a slave. So he is, they go to his parent, his dad, and tell him, you know, he's been eaten by wild animals. They give him his coat. And he lives a kind of a troubled years until um, he becomes kind of powerful in the government. And the biggest thing that I saw out of that is I get mad when my sister doesn't answer the phone. <laughs> and this guy, Joseph, is like his family comes to him, and he has I would say, or, you know, in the world that we live in has every right to be like, I have nothing for you. You don't deserve any of my love. You don't deserve to be taken care of. You can just go about your business. But he doesn't say that he doesn't just help his brothers. He actually says the best in all Egypt will be yours. And I just think about that when we think of how we're supposed to be for others, the what is Christ? He is constantly forgiving. I disappoint him on a daily basis and he continues to show favor on me. So I just think that if we think about the amount of grace that we're expecting for ourselves, we have to be willing to give that same in return. Um, So before Brody was like a big football star, um, he played flag football. So he started out with flag football His first year of um, playing the sport, he got a little trophy. And at the same time, my daughter was taking dance class. She hated it. She wanted to play football too, but we made her stick it out. So she gets to the end of her recital, and Brody comes to the recital with us. He was small. I think he was probably four. She was three. And so he heard that she was going to get a trophy as well at the end of this um, recital. 
So here's a picture of my son. You can see that he actually brings his own football trophy <laughs> so that he could have the trophy because he was like, she absolutely cannot have something without me being acknowledged. And so <laughs> look how cute she was, though. And his trophy was so small, and hers was so much bigger. And he was like, she gets flowers? What, what is this? Anyways, he was so proud of um, himself and didn't want to acknowledge that Ryan, it was her moment. And don't you think that's how we are? That's how the church tends to be, is we tend to one-up people. So, oh, you got a pool? Oh, I have a hot tub. Oh, you got, you've been married 12 years? Oh, I've been married 24 you know, we, we do that with each other. We'll go to people's houses. It's beautiful. And we'll say, I bet you they're in a lot of debt, though. Or you'll go home and you'll say, my house is terrible. Like, look at my house compared to their house. And, y'all, we have got to get to a place where we are unified and we're able to celebrate people's successes. If somebody has something great and a blessing, we should be thankful. We should be like, God, thank you for their marriage. Their marriage is great, and that is because of God. When I met my husband, his mom said, what makes you think that this is going to work out? Like, what makes you think that you're a kid, you're marrying a kid? And he said, because of God. And I believe that God has blessed our relationship because of God, because we've acknowledged God, because we put it first. We have to get to where we're desperate for people to see Christ, and they're not seeing it in us, y'all. I, I know that I'm personally convicted by this message. They are not seeing it. We go to a, a multicultural church, and I love to tell people that. I love that this is what heaven will look like. I love the idea that we are becoming a perfectly reconciled family. Y'all, but do we leave these doors and live that way? Are we leaving these doors and still being like, you know, we are all created equal, that we all have a share in the kingdom? That is where we have to get to work. Y'all, we've got to see like him. We've got to talk like him. We've got to pray like him. I listened to a pastor the other day, and he said, do we have to work hard for God? No, we, we have faith. We don't have to work hard for God. And he was like, we do. And how we do that is we say, okay, instead of saying, oh, I'm going to pray for you, we're going to pray right then. We're going to pray for them. Sheila prayed for me this morning, and God basically told her all my prayers last night, apparently. And she reiterated them to me. But because she was obedient, God was like, see, I have you. And that is what we have to do. But we spend time on our social media talking about our platforms that are not promoting peace, hope, joy, the things that are of God. There's so many hurting people. I spent this last weekend with my sister and um, she got together with some girls that she was in the Air Force with 25 years ago. And one of the girls, I, I immediately thought, well, like, she has not grown up. She doesn't this and that. And God immediately convicted me and said, you need to be broken that she doesn't know me. And you need to be saying to her, let me tell you about this God. I have a really close friend, my closest friend, and I apologized to her a couple months ago because I will pray for anybody. I'll pray for people in the grocery store, but I wouldn't pray for her because I was afraid that she would be offended. And shame on me, shame on us as the church if we cannot be bold for God. Um, my grandmother prayed for me. My dad is here and his mother was an amazing woman. She died when I was really young. But I remember specifically, people would be ugly and nasty, and she would be like, oh, they mean well. And she represented the love of Christ in a way that stuck with me. And that is how we have to be, God, about God. We have to tell people that he is good, that his, his word is true, that he doesn't lie. Ephesians 2, 17 through 19 says, He came and proclaimed the good news of peace to you who are far away and the peace to those who are near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. 
So then you are no longer foreigners, strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints, the member members of God's household. Y'all, we used to be separated from him. I can, you know, we all can tell our testimony of when it was that God found us. I was 18. My grandmother's church had a revival. I have no idea what the guy preached about, but the whole time I felt my heart racing and God was saying, like, enough is enough. You've tried this on your own. You have no hope. And I could not wait for him to stop talking so that I could get to the altar and give him my life. And we all have that same story, but we can't be good enough for him. We can't um, read our Bible enough to please him. We have to be like him. And we have to accept the fact that he has rich in mercy forgiven us and made us one with him, not because of anything that we ever did. <sighs> Ephesians 2, 20 through 22 says, um, built on a foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building being put together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, the whole building being built together for God's dwelling in the spirit. Y'all, each and every one of us are part of his plan. If you're just coming to church and being fed by the pastor for 20 minutes on Sunday and you go home and you feel empty, there's a reason. He cannot be the only one feeding us. We cannot be the only one that or we have to do the work. We have to pray for our children. If we're not praying for our kids, I think about people that are pursuing your children online. There are people that pursue them, and they're going to go with who pursues them. That's why people join gangs, because they want to feel part of something. I just, I can't get away from the fact that the Lord is saying to us, our kids our co-workers, the girl at the grocery store, we come in here and we worship God and we feel his spirit and we're touched by him. And then we go out, we eat lunch. The server is sad and we say nothing to her. That can't be the church. The church is past that. There, there are people in this room right now that would say, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know this God that you're talking about. And we're keeping it to ourselves. God has saved me and I've kept my mouth shut. And I, I just feel like there's a point now that the church has to be better. That if you, it, who here doesn't know somebody affected by suicide? We don't because everybody is so broken and we have got to get to a place where we're tired those that are walking not in hope, that you're tired of not having hope, that you're sticking with some family traditions or things that your parents taught you about God that aren't true and they aren't getting you anywhere. You still feel lost. You still feel hurt. You still feel alone. That I just pray that we can get to be the church that is representing what he has done for us. Far beyond coming in on Sundays and, and professing to be a Christian, like what are we doing? That we got saved and the scripture says he told them, go and go. He didn't say, hey, Pastor Ryan, make sure you go and tell people, if God has saved you, you are to go. You are to say, you are supposed to be the one that is telling people. And I just... I want my kids to know God. I want them to have their own experience with God. When I was a teenager, my mom was going through a lot of emotional stuff. And, um, and one night she said to me and my middle sister, um, God is not real. Everything I've told you is a complete lie. I'm all alone. There's nobody for us. And we were like, what? How can this? We weren't even Christians at the time. And we were like, how could this be? This can't be right. And a couple hours later, she came back to me and she was like, but he is my only hope. 
But he is, I can't stop praying to him because he is my only hope. That is what we have to pray for our kids, for this world, is that no matter what we feel, that God will continue to pursue us and he is our hope. I heard um, Lisa Bevere, I don't know how to say her last name, say, um, people will either know his promises or they will know your fears. And we have to get to where we're talking to people about truth. The girl that called me about having this overwhelming anxiety, I was like, well, you need to get some, some scripture. You need to speak that over yourself. But are we doing that for ourselves? So I just want to challenge each one of us. Um, Jude 1.22 says, go easy on those who hesitate in the faith. Go after those who take the wrong way. Be tender with sinners, but not soft on sin. Um, my grandmother used to always say, don't have any kids, because by the time you do, this world's going to be terrible. It's going to be awful. They'll <laughs> just don't do it. And I believe that it's because the church is believing and watering everything down and believing that this is just something that we do. This is just part of, you know, hey, I'm, a, I'm an American. I believe, you know, God. Do we believe the word? Are we telling people that they're going to die and go to hell if they don't know Christ? And I don't want to see people like that. I know there's people in this room that feel lost and feel alone and feel like they have no hope. And the person sitting next to you has it and hasn't told you anything about it. So I think about the church and how we have to love, we have to speak love, and we got to speak truth. But we do one or the other. We don't do both. We either all love, love the sinner, love the, you know, we are just all accepting, or we speak truth over you. Look, you are about to go to hell. You don't know what you're doing. You can't be doing that kind of stuff. My sin is nothing compared to what you're doing. And we have to do both. We have to love and we have to speak truth both together. There is no in between. The Lord said, speak truth over people. But Jesus never went up to the girl at the well and said, I know what you do. I know all about you, girl. He said, I know you. Let me love you. He made a special trip to find her at the well. Are we making special trips to find people at the well? We're, we have to be better. We have to change what becomes an important priority in our lives. So the, God has given each one of us something. If you are funny, you are meant to bring joy to That's like That's a gift God gave you. I used to always say, I can't sing, I can't dance, I can't play an instrument. Like, God, what can I do? I can talk to the wall about anything. I could talk to anybody about anything. And years later, the pastor's like, oh, hey, did you want to preach? And I'm like, what? But God gave us things that are our things. My husband is great with uh, money and numbers, and so is my son. Somebody needs that. Somebody here, if you, you know, we have to offer up what we have. I will never be able to sing. I, actually, all morning I was hoping, you know, making sure this wasn't on while I was singing up there. But we have to know what we have has value. What we have to offer this world has value. It might not look like what mine is or what hers is. I mean, we can go around comparing ourselves, but I always look at like Becca, who would immediately pray for somebody. And I'm like, God, I want that. That's something that I could have. And I can do that by not just saying, I'll be praying for you. God challenged me to say, okay, if somebody says that they need prayer, you pray right then. It becomes awkward sometimes with people I barely know. They're like, hey, pray for me, a husband. Girl, let's pray right now. So we have got to get to that place. If you feel really deeply, I know there's some people that are like, I'm, I feel so much. God gave you a compassionate heart for a reason. My nieces have the most uh, genuine, loving personality. They just exude like just love. Um, and that's not by mistake. God has placed in each one of us something that has, is going to make value to the kingdom. And we have to think kingdom minded. We're not thinking about the kingdom. We're thinking about us and what makes me and my life more comfortable 
our prayers are like, Lord, don't let my kids drink. When it should be, let my kids be full of your spirit and let them see it in me. Let them not just be words that I say, but I could be living that out. I disappoint my kids all the time. I think the last time my son was here, I was like, babe, I'm just so bad sometimes. And he's like, what are you talking about? But we can get so hard on ourselves, but we also have to know that we are, our children were given to us. When my son went to college, I was really sad and I didn't want him to leave. And God gave me this vision of him having my son, that he had him. And then he gave them him to me. And then I had to give him back. And so I just think that we have a, an obligation to be more than just speakers of the word, that we have to be doers of the word. The, the Ephesians has been a book that I initially used to always read and be like, oh, this is just how generous God is to me and how he just, you know, gave to me because he chose me. And, and that's great. And that is what it is. But it's also, what are you doing with it, though? Like unity comes from where the church is being built together. It's not that we are individuals it says we're being built together, understanding that each person has their thing to bring to the table. So if the worship team wants to come up, I'm going to um, just kind of go over. Ephesians um, is representative of the past, present, and future for Christ Christians. So we were alienated. We were separated. We were strangers. We were hopeless. We were godless. We were cut off. And I just know that there are people that are feeling all of those things right this moment. Um, and there are Christians that are feeling that right this moment. So what is stopping us from becoming whole and not just God is, yeah, I, I believe in God and I believe, you know, Jesus died on the cross for my sin. Where are we, when are we going to get to the place where we are desperate for him, that the fire that we have is going to overflow on other people? Um, just, just professing will get us to heaven. It's not going to give us a peaceful life. We've got to know him. We've got to know his word. And we've got to talk about the hope that we have. So I know that there's probably people um, that don't know how to do that, that you don't know what that looks like. And the first thing I would say is you've got to pray. We've got to really pray. And it can't be just, thank you, God, you know, help me with this, a checklist of things. Like our prayer has to change into what are you trying to show me? We should walk into service and be like, what are you saying to me? What am I supposed to change? Not do I, oh, my friend's here. I hope they hear this. No, what about me? Like what is in me that has to be different? And so we have got to pray. Secondly, we have to really, really know him. And we've got to long to know him. Just Reading our Bible occasionally is not enough. If you read the Bible, he, you can just see like, okay, he's put all this together. Like that lines up with this over here. And he, there's no mistake in it. There's no mistake in you being here today. There's no mistake in God's plan for your life that he has put it all in place together. So with Christ, we are now brought near we are peace-filled, we are reconciled, we are citizens, saints, and members of God's family. So right now, I'd like to pray. Um, if anybody would like to, to pray, um, they're welcome to come down. Um, but I just wanna pray that God would speak to each one of us that this would be more than just a time filler that we do on Sunday mornings. I wanna pray that God would give us his spirit, um, not just as a, you know, on my terms, that we become so open to whatever he has. 
And that I want to pray for those that just feel so broken, that have never introduced themselves to the Savior that's constantly a coming to your door that's telling you that he is real that is saying you feel lost because you don't have me so if anybody would like to pray you're welcome to come down dear lord god i am so grateful to know you i'm so grateful that i had praying grandmothers i'm grateful that they didn't care about what the world was gonna look like, that they knew that if I just believed that God would take care of me, he would. God, I thank you for, for just time after time where you have made a way. God, I pray for each one of us individually that we would see you in our day. God, that we would see people, not just angry people, but we would see the hurt in them. That we'd feel so challenged to speak up, that we would feel so challenged to speak truth over people and not care what they thought. Because God, in the end, if I plant a seed, it might not happen today, but you will grow it. God, I pray for everyone that's concerned about their kids and what they are gonna do in, the, in life. And God, you said, train up a child and you would do the rest. And God, I just pray for each person here that we would continue to see you in our lives, that we would feel challenged to tell people of how good you are and how true you are and that you don't lie and that you're here for us, that you are for us. I thank you that your spirit has revealed in us that you are real. God, I know it's only through you that I am saved, that I know anything about you that I can believe. I thank you for my belief, God. I ask that each day as we go, that we just draw closer to you, that we feel a passion for you because the things that we're filling ourselves up with in this world are not working, God. And so we just ask that you would just pour more into us, just pour into us that we could overflow on others. I've seen a picture of before of a matchbook and it has one match in it that's lit up and how it catches all the rest that matches on fire just by being near God. And I just pray that that this week, that each person that we interact with, that you would just show them your love through us. Lord, Holy Spirit, convict us when we are not representing you well. God, I pray more and more and more and more and more of you, God, that you would just pour into us, that we would not be satisfied with how we are right now, God, that we just wanna be more like you. And I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching today's video. If you made a commitment of any kind, or you made a first time decision to accept Christ, we want to hear from you. Email us at info at onechurchnc.net. If today's message encouraged you, we want to encourage you to give so that we can continue to share the hope of Jesus. You can do that by visiting onechurchnc.net slash give.